I'm doing all right. I was on a TV show. I don't know if you heard that. <laughs> I heard Pretty about well it. Pretty well known. Not so much in Iceland. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I had to Google you. I'm afraid. Soul Pancake presents An Idiot's Guide to Climate Change. Hi. My name is Rain. I am an actor and I care about the planet. So I'm going to Greenland with some scientists to witness firsthand the melting of the glaciers and learn some hard science about climate change. I pray this makes even a little bit of difference. Also, don't be an idiot. Rain. Come on. I'm too shy to uh, talk in my seat on the airplane. Don't worry, I'm not pooping or anything. Is this thing working? So one thing that kind of freaks me out about this trip is all the carbon that I'm using. How much carbon have I used flying in this plane? Oh, what does that mean? Does that mean I have to plant like a thousand trees to make up for it? I don't know, let's find out. I don't want to be one of those climate hypocrites, but maybe I am. Okay, here we go. First up, to learn some basic facts about climate change, I touched down in Reykjavik, Iceland, a country rich in history, from Vikings to elves, no McDonald's, and only about 365,000 people in the entire country, one of which is astronomer and climate change expert Saivar Helgi Bragason, the Bill Nye of Iceland. Three, two, one. I am a trained actor. Well, since you're uh, the Icelandic expert and I'm beginning this journey and my uh, knowledge and my learning about uh, climate change, d take me through the, I don't know, top 10 salient points about climate change. I'll try my best, definitely. But the reason we are in this mess is because we are burning fossil fuels. We're okay. taking uh, stored carbon from deep underground yep. and pumping it up into the atmosphere, yep. wrapping the Earth into a warmer blanket, which means that the average temperature on the Earth is increasing. And when you increase the average temperature on the Earth, of course, you have more extreme weathers, for example, and also acidify the oceans, okay. which is a horrible thing because we know next to nothing of how that will actually change. In about 200 years, we have changed the chemistry of the ocean more than the Earth has or nature has for the past 50 million years or so. Humanity has changed the chemistry. chemistry of the oceans in the last 200 years more than in planet Earth in the last 50 million years? That's right. Each day, we pump up about 100 million tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. Every single day, yes. three volcanoes going off nonstop it, to equal what humanity is pouring into the atmosphere. That's right. It's almost the way we live. Right. <laughs> so we need to change everything. Another one you hear a lot in the States is like, well, China and India produce so much more CO2. Why should we do anything until they get their act together? Well, because historically, we are the biggest co contributors. Half of the emission of CO2 into the atmosphere comes from about 10% richest part of the population of the Earth. A person, for example, in India uh, is responsible for about two tons per person per year. Okay. But in the US, well, it's about 20 tons person. Holy moly. So it's our fault. That we need up. to change our ways. Yeah. Not the poor people. We have to uh, help the I'm poor doing people. all right. I was on a TV show. I don't know if you heard that. <laughs> I heard Pretty about well it. Known. Although Not so I, much in Iceland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I had to Google you. I'm afraid. Oh, you're a horrible man. <laughs> I then asked Saivar what the main causes were behind all these emissions wrecking havoc on the planet. Doing great. I'm, I'm good. Here we go. Construction. Yep. We use a lot of cement. Choices we make when it comes to the food we consume. Red meat. Red meat is a big source of CO2 emissions as well. We keep cutting down trees, which are kind of like natural vacuum cleaners for CO2. So then planting trees might be a helpful solution. Planting trees is definitely a helpful Not solution. Not eating beef. At least less beef. Boom. How do you like that? <laughs> Boom. Uh, food wasted. We waste an awful lot of the food we buy. About right. a third or so ends up in the trash. Whenever we throw our trash into landfills, uh -huh. it breaks down. Does that create CO2? or that, that does create CO2 and also methane. Methane is a much more powerful uh, greenhouse gas. We call it methane, methane, just so you know. Methane or methane. You can say methane. <laughs> you say methane, we I say, say methane. We say, we say methane. Clothes. We use a, an awful lot of clothes. It takes a great deal of energy and water and everything to produce clothes. Isn't it um, just general consumerism of just buying lots and lots of manufactured oh. stuff? Manufacturing is a big contributor as well, especially when it comes to electronics, because uh -huh. you need to dig up all the metals to use in your electronic devices. Also, the way we transport things around the world using airplanes and ships and cars. Maybe we need to slow down a little bit. 
and co con consume a little bit less. Right. We don't need to fill our houses with crap we don't really need. Like, I don't know, I don't know how many vases you have at home. Are they all, are all of them filled with flowers or are they just there? Yeah, I've got like six vases in a cupboard yeah. that I had never used. Yeah. And I don't know how you uh, transport yourself if, if, or commute. Uh, I don't know if you use bicycles or a walk or something like that. Now I have electric car. Electric car yeah. I'm planning on making this whole trip carbon neutral by okay. giving back to all of the transportation that um, and CO2 that I've produced on this tour. Okay, I admit this trip is going to rack up quite a large carbon footprint. So far, I've taken a 12-hour international flight, which equals approximately 45,000 gallons of gas, or 360 per person, about five paper cups and three car rides, which leaves a carbon footprint of about 2.5 metric tons of CO2. But there was one transport company that showed me how it's trying to lower its carbon footprint. Toyota of Iceland. Wow. It's like a museum of cars. Now I know what you're thinking, because I'm a celebrity, I get a lot of free stuff, but that's not why I'm here, at least not today. I wanted to visit them to see how companies are trying to help the planet instead of harm it. And Toyota of Iceland recently won a top environmental award. What are we looking at? We're at the body and paint shop of uh, Toyota. These are the booths that we use to heat the cars once they've been uh, painted, and uh, that helps dry the paint. Before, we used to do this with oil. But right now, we use geothermal water. It goes down and it heats the, the cars and no oil is burnt. So we've oh, wow. managed to decrease our impact on the environment dramatically by doing this. And that's not all Toyota of Iceland is doing. They're also trying to reverse the effects of climate change by restoring a massive amount of wetlands. Yes, wetlands. Should've worn my boots, these are actual wetlands. Well, what we used to do in the past, we've been digging these ditches to drain the wetlands for farming purposes and other purposes. We do the same in the States. We dry them out and then put in housing projects and shopping malls on the wetlands because right. people didn't really recognize their worth. We have dried up so much land that it's increasing the emission of greenhouse gases. So to drying out the land emits methane and stored CO2 that was in the soil. Right. So you're helping restore some of these native wetlands? Right, there didn't used to be any water here. So we closed these ditches here. The water is rising again. The emitting of greenhouse gases is slowing down and stopping, and we see the birds coming back to a place where they weren't before. Who knew wetlands or bird swamps could actually store CO2? That leads me back to where I left off. My last question for our scientist, Saivar. Did you talk about uh, biodiversity? Did you, did you talk about... Uh... And as it turns out, there are actually office fans in Iceland. Well, Viking knows Viking. What percentages of the Earth's uh, animal species will be lost to climate change in, say, the next 20 to 50 years? Well, we know that about 25% of all plant and animal species on the Earth are in danger of becoming extinct. And if we look throughout Earth's history, we can find at least one event for the past 100 million years or so where the same or even worse has occurred. It's and a was, mass extinction. That's right. It was mm -hmm. about 66 million years ago when an mm -hmm. asteroid impacted us. But these days we are the asteroid and we have to stop it. We have to do everything we possibly can to do so. Looking down over downtown Reykjavik, I've met so many amazing people here today. I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed. I'm feeling a little bit daunted. I mean, what am I doing? I have a video camera on the end of a stick and I'm talking to myself and I'm about to go land on a glacier at ground zero for the climate crisis. And you know what? I don't know anything. The science is so complex the sociology of this whole expedition is so complex. I mean, this issue is not just like pollution, it's economics, it's social justice, it's how humanity relates to its precious mother earth, it's how we relate to each other. It's like an onion, the more you dig into the issues around climate change, uh, around climate activism, the more complicated they get. I don't know that I know any more now than when I started. And uh, I'm going to bed a little bit afraid of what I'm going to find out on those glaciers in the next couple of days. Coming up, 
on An Idiot's Guide to Climate Change. I've seen some crazy in my days, but man, oh man, I've never seen anything like this. Ground zero for climate change. What happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. How warm is it getting in the Arctic? Right, so... Whoa! We're stuck on a harbor in Greenland. Keep your thoughts and prayers coming, please. Thoughts and prayers coming. Thoughts and prayers on a boat.